This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Hey everyone, it's Greg Stanley and welcome to the Collector Car Podcast. To kick off 2020, I decided to come up with 15 cars to buy, sell, and hold. And before we get to that, just a quick update. I just redid the website, still working on it, so I'm not a web expert. It's actually my second one I've ever done, so please excuse the poor quality, but I'm doing my best. And so I basically categorized everything so you can listen to the podcast that interests you in an easier and better way. So gone are the cool pictures of the album artwork for the podcast but you can still see those on itunes and spotify all the tremendously hard work i've put into making each one of those which are pretty cool if i must say so myself i try to keep them relevant and colorful with cool cars on the artwork or on the album covers so i broke up the home page into 15 categories so click on the category it'll pull up all the podcasts that relate to that category so the categories are market trends that's the most important aspect of this podcast Then it's the collectors, the experts, the auctions, the dealers, the museums, muscle cars, Porsches, exotics, European cars, young timers, JDM, Asian cars, American cars, pre-war classics. And then the last category is just for fun. One example of that are the condensed versions of Keep Cash and Crush. And then also, like I had the 12 days of a car Christmas this past Christmas that people seem to really, really like. So some some podcasts will fall into multiple categories. So one example would be the one from last week, Ron Barnaba. He's a Porsche guy. He's been with Porsche for 50 years. So obviously, it falls in that category. But he's also a dealer, an expert in the field, and a collector. So his actually falls in all four categories. If you like what I'm doing, please share this podcast with your friends. I need more subscribers, more downloads to keep this thing going. I really do enjoy it. So I hope you do too. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and download it weekly. Uh, And then if you would, you can follow me on Instagram at The Collector Car Podcast. And I started trying to coordinate pictures I've taken in the field at dealerships, at collectors' garages with the actual episode. So for example, last week was Ron Barnaba and I posted pictures on Instagram of my visit at his Chicago shop, which I took pictures of the RSRs that were there. So kind of cool. I just posted a video on Facebook of me walking around. It was meant for Instagram stories, which is why it's in the vertical format, not horizontal. I hate it when you have to watch the vertical format on like YouTube. It is so annoying. I wish Instagram was a little bit better. So this entire episode was prompted by a recent article I read, and it was called Haggerty's 2020 Bull Market List, 10 Collector Cars and One Bike on the Rise This Year. So I decided I don't want to focus in on just what's rising. How about I focus on a little bit of everything? So I wanted to not duplicate what they did. There ended up being two because the numbers are the numbers. So instead of only cars to buy that will be appreciating in 2020, I chose 15 cars, five to buy, five to hold, and five to sell now. The buy cars are ones that have investment potential. The hold cars are where their value trend has flattened out, maybe softened slightly, or have declined. So if you can go back to my air-cooled Porsches episode from a little while ago, those, I said, are softening. The only one that was declining was 993 prices. And I think Hackerty also had an article on that recently, or someone had a Facebook post talking about why the 993 prices are declining. Now, the sell cars, uh, those are ones that have decreased significantly. Their value trend is declining with no change in sight. So sometimes it could be a car that's declining pretty hard, but I might have it as a buy because I think it's going to bottom out. Other times it could be a car that's declining, and I think it's going to continue to decline because of buyer trends. You know, folks are just not buying those cars anymore. So I'm going to start with the boring one first. I call it boring because you're holding on to these cars. So the first one are the Porsche 996s. That's the base Carrera and the Turbo. I mentioned on a previous podcast that the 996s have been up recently. And the the Carrera, the base 996s, were up about a percent the latest year. But they were up almost 6% over the last three years. So those have depreciated. They bottomed out. Now they're going back up. I think they will continue to go back up, but I have those as a hold right now. Those numbers mirror the turbos really closely. So 
both 996s, actually any of them. The ones to really watch out for that will be collectibles in the future are the GT2s and the GT3s. Those are really good long-term collectibles. Those are probably the only ones that will really have significant value in the future, and they're expensive now. I think the GT3 is the number one condition. They're about 115 grand, and the GT2s are about 160 grand. The next one to hold is the Ford GT. Now this is the 2005-2006 model, not the 2000 whatever it is 17 model. So these were up 10 almost 11% in the latest 3 years, but they've been down 4% over the last year. Reasons to hold on to this car is I think it's pretty much kind of stayed the same. I think it might go up a little bit. The new Ford GT is now open to all buyers to 2017. So some will be selling their older generation the 2005 to 2006 to upgrade to the new. The heritage editions for either model with low miles will continue to hold their value. The next one to hold is a Pontiac Firebird Formula SLP Firehawk. I love these when I was in high school. They're very, very rare for a Firebird. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but you rarely ever see these and they have a lot of horsepower for the time frame. Pretty quick and pretty cool looking. Now I say hold on these because they pretty much ran up quite a bit in value in the last three years, up 23.4%, but they declined in the latest year by 6%. So I think this big run-up has adjusted itself, so they're negative for a little bit, and I think they'll slowly appreciate because of their low production numbers. The next one is an interesting one. It's the generation, second-generation Dodge Viper GTS. These were made 1996 to 2002. This is one that Haggerty recommends. Uh, let's see. The introductory year of the GTS was has been up very strong. Latest three years, it was up 27%. The latest year has been up 15%. So those might have tapped out. You might not be able to get one of those without spending a lot of money, and they might start declining a little bit because everybody went for the first one in the famous Viper GTS Blue with white stripes. Uh, but I think that means the other ones, 9 1996 will start going up because people can't afford the 96. So they're going to go to the 1997 to 2002. Now, if you look at the non 1996, they've actually been down uh, 11% the latest year. So it's interesting that that introductory year is so popular. Uh, This one is the more driver friendly version. The generation one didn't have roll up windows and a lot of other things. So I think this will appreciate in the coming years. Now the Haggerty comment on this particular model was vipers are fast easy to live with their looks still stop folks in their tracks and let's not forget the bonus shelby connection that's a lot of boxes checked for not a lot of money for now so they expect it to go up they also said generation xers and millennials are now 64 percent of the quotes on this car so those are the two generations that are buying this car and that should just increase now the last one i have is a hold or JDM cars, that's the Japanese domestic market cars. A lot of you are probably wondering, why am I saying this? Shouldn't this be a heavy buy time that these are finally getting their due and they're finally coming into the U.S.? We're finally going to have the really nice, powerful GTR Godzillas. Well, yes, but the fact that there's more coming into the U.S., that should actually deflate prices a little bit. I think the cars that are truly special, the GTRs, those will hold their value I think the lesser models, like the Skylines and the was it the Fair Ladies, they might not unless they're top of the line performance. So we'll have more coming into the U.S. There'll probably be more interest. There'll probably be a lot more aftermarket suppliers, but I think it will dilute it a little bit. So we just have to kind of wait and see. Now let's go to the sell category. These are the cars that I and trucks that I think you should sell. Now I thought I had five on this, but I'm only counting four. So my bad. So Toyota FJs, the one I priced was a 1975 version. These went up tremendously five, six, seven years ago to where they became astronomically priced, like seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. Well, the latest three years are down 17%, the latest year 12%. So they're still declining at double digits. I think this will slow. A lot of things that has to do with this is that people realize that these are slow, cramped, and laborious to drive. Really cool looking. I'd love to have a white one to match my 2014 Toyota FJ. That would be really, really cool. And the thing that might be the curveball are the icons of the world, the folks that are taking these, buying them up, and putting all new parts and pieces and drivetrains on them to make them two, three hundred thousand dollar showpiece of art. You know, that's that might keep them kind of stabilize them a little bit. The next one's a 1978 Pontiac Trans Am, the screaming chicken on the hood. 
This is the one famously seen in Smokey and the Bandit. These have been flat the most recent year and the last three years, like no movement whatsoever. Unfortunately, Burt Reynolds has passed away. Uh, there's a lot of them out there, and I don't see any Smokey and Bandit revivals on the horizon anytime soon. So I think the movie impact is pretty big. I don't think anything will happen there. I think interest in these cars will slowly decline. They're by far one of the coolest cars of 1978 era, but they still weren't tremendously fast. And even when it sold, it sold, I want to say for 600 grand. It wasn't one of the high dollar movie cars, just showed how some of the interest in Smoking the Bandit has waned over the past decade or so. Now the next two kind of talk to the generational shift that's going on out there. So we have a lot more Gen Xers and millennials buying cars, meaning some of the baby boomers are dying off. And so those cars that they held in chairs for so long are declining in value. Uh, they're just not wanted as much. Now, the first group is the 1955 to 57 Chevrolet Bel Airs. Beautiful, classic, iconic cars. But these are declining across all three years. And majority of the models are all declining. So the trend across all three years was about 6% down. The latest year was about 3%. So it's just a slow downward spiral. I don't see these increasing anytime soon. I think it'll just keep on chipping away 3 to 4% every year for the foreseeable future. And the next one that kind of mirrors this is 1958 Town & Country. These were high-dollar cars. You know, they were $140,000, $180,000 cars, and they've been down 12.5% the latest year and 23% the latest three years. So double-digit declines for the last three years. Ah, here's the fifth sell car that I forgot. It's actually a group of cars. The last one I would pick to sell believe it or not, are the 2015 hypercars. Yes, I'm talking to you, LaFerrari, Porsche 918 Spider, McLaren P1. These were extremely expensive when new, 1.3 to like $2 million new, and they appreciated quickly, and they've been doing nothing but depreciating since then. So I would think the reasonings there would be other supercars coming out. you got the new McLaren Speedtail, I believe, the successor to the iconic F1, supposedly. We will see. That's the car I picked out for as Jay Leno's next car. We'll see if he actually buys one. La Ferrari is probably the prettiest of the three in my book. The Porsche 918 is really close. The numbers on this, the La Ferrari has declined 16.7% the last year, almost 23% the last three years. The 918 Spider, big drop in the last year and three years, 33.3%. And then the McLaren P1 down 13% the last year. 28% the last three years. So looking at all three of these combined, they're down 20% in the last 52 weeks and seven, 27% in the last three years. So that is just nuts. That's my biggest sell at this point. It might be a little controversial, but who cares? Now for the fun ones, the ones to buy. So the first one is a 1980s Bronco. So any of the late 1980s Bronco, these have been up just a little bit. This is why I think it's showing a trend that will continue. They were up only 4.3% the latest three years and 2.1% in the latest year. I think as the generational shift continues, more folks will come into the late 80s cars, trucks, and SUVs. And Gen Xers like myself will be looking for cars from their high school years. 1989 was a great year. The next one to buy, and I've mentioned this on a few other podcasts, is the 1970s. International Scout 2s, 4x4s. Actually, like 90% of the Scouts were 4x4, so I really don't need to say that. Now, the average of the three model years I picked, 1971, 1974, and 1978, were up 15% the latest year and almost 30% the latest three years. And they're still reasonable. They're like 30 grand. So why will these continue to go up? A couple different reasons here. FJ prices have gone through the roof, like I talked about. The Bronco... Classic vintage Bronco prices have appreciated even more than the FJ. So the early Broncos, the early FJs are kind of out of touch for the average buyer. We have a new Bronco coming out that will keep the vintage Bronco prices high. And I think more folks will seek out a cheaper alternative, such as the International Scouts. Now, Resto Motors, as I mentioned before, the icons of the world will continue to sell Broncos and FJs, sucking those up so people will want to buy the International Scouts. I bet they'll even start... You'll see some of these resto-modded scouts out there for $200,000. $200, now, again, this is another one Haggerty mentioned. Here's the Haggerty quote. The scout is the last of the affordable classic sport utes. American rivals such as the Ford Bronco and Chevy Blazer have out-appreciated the scout, but its values are on a steady climb 
the result of enthusiasts realizing they can have the same amount of fun and curb appeal for a fraction of the Bronco price. Low buy-in and a high ceiling. So basically what I just said in a much more verbose and fluent pleasing way. <laughs> now the next one to buy, which really surprised me because I just sold mine like a year and a half ago, 1964, 1960s Ford Mustangs with a small block. Surprised me because I kind of heard, well, there's this big generational shift going on, but we're seeing the Mustangs and a couple of the other pony cars starting to increase. They were flat for years. Now in the last year or so, they're starting to increase. I think one of the reasons why is that because the folks that decided I want to buy my car from my childhood, from the 1970s and 1980s, they realized those, for the most part, are not great cars. There's a couple of exceptions. Like I said before, 1978, you have the Pontiac Trans Am. 1986, you have the Grand National, Buick Grand National. There's not a lot of great cars. And so I think some of those folks are like, let's go back to the heyday of the muscle cars. Let's go back to the 60s. And they can't afford the big block cars, so they're starting out with the small block cars. Now, these are easy to work on. Parts of, are available everywhere. They're cheap to keep running. I replaced my alternator in my 66 Mustang convertible for $41, and it took three bolts, and it took me about 30 minutes to do it, which is a long time if you ask any mechanic. He probably is like, I should have taken like eight minutes. Now, another reference for this fact would be a 1970 Pontiac Firebird Formula 400. That's a big block, uh, up 5% the latest year. Uh, let's see, the average of the three cars I picked, a 66 Mustang GT convertible, a 68 Mustang GT convertible, and a 69 Mach 1 with the 351 four-barrel, they were up, uh, like I said, they were flat for a number of years, and all of them were up approximately 5% in the latest years. So all of them had turned up just a little bit. Now, not all of them are up. That leads to our next example. This is a definite buy. If I had the money right now, this is a car I'd buy. A 1970 Plymouth Cuda AAR. Now, the reason I buy this is they are gorgeous. It's a small block. It's a 340. I think it has three two barrels on it and a just gorgeous car. Now, it was down 28% over the last year and 33% over the latest three years. So this thing has been tanking. I feel like this thing has bottomed out. I don't know why it's been taking such a hard hit. Other Plymouth performance cars of 1970, such as the Roadrunner GTX and Barracuda, they have fluctuated over the last three or four years, but they haven't been down like this. This one's been just like a rock going to the bottom of an ocean. It is really, really nuts. So I think these have bottomed out, or will be shortly, and the times of getting a AAR CUDA for 100 grand might be gone in another year or so because they're back up to the 150, dollars $160,000 range. Now the next one is another car I'd love to have. I'm calling the ones to buy the early 2000s 2001 2002 2003 bmw non m cars now why not the m cars well the m cars are extremely expensive now now those are great ones to buy I, they might have plateaued i'm not sure but listen to these numbers for these m cars so the m coupe from 2003 also known as the clown shoe i absolutely love that car it was up 38 percent in the latest year and 50 percent in the latest three years that one has skyrocketed in the last couple of years. The other BMW from 2003 is the M3 E34. It was up 66% the latest three years, and it's only up 5.3% the latest year. So it slowed down tremendously. And then the last one, the big dog, my dream BMW, 2003. BMW M5 E39, same numbers basically as the M3, up 67% the latest three years and up 52 in the latest year. So you can see this astronomical rise in these cars. All three of them were up 15.8% in the last year driven by the clown shoe. Now, because these are so expensive now, I think everybody's going to be looking at the ones that are not M cars, the 328s, the three, I think, 18s. And uh, those will have, those prices will start going up significantly. So get those while you can. So thanks again for joining me this week. I will review these 15 cars a year from now when I identify which cars to buy, sell, and hold for 2021. So as always, keep your tire straight, foot on the gas, and have a great week. I will talk to you all next week. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast.